Hello, welcome to this fifth video in a series of five videos about survey research in the digital age. So this covers additions and extensions beyond what is covered in chapter three of Bit by Bit. So before watching this video, you should either read chapter three of Bit by Bit or watch the other four videos in this series. So I wanna talk about two additions and extensions in this video. The first is about wiki surveys which has to do with a, a new way that we can collect survey data. So as I talked about before, the third era of survey research, I think the interviews will be characterized by computer administered interviews. And with this wiki survey project, we try to really reimagine what's possible if we move to a fully computer administered interview. We don't need to merely keep doing the kinds of things that we did when we interviewed people, when we had humans doing the interviews. In other words, the transition from human administered interviews to computer administered interviews, it enables change and it requires change. And so I think a great insight for what the future of survey research could look like comes from this website, kittenwar.com. So if you go to kittenwar.com, then you won't hear anything I say in the rest of this talk. So please don't do that right now. You can do it after this video is over. So after the video is over, go to kittenwar.com and what you will see is something that looks like this. You'll see two really cute kittens. You can click on whichever one you think is cuter and then you'll see a new pair and then you could click again and again and again and before you know it, you spend 20 minutes clicking on kittens. Um, so in addition to being an enjoyable way to spend your time, there's actually something much deeper that's happening here. So these are what the, some of the winningest kittens look like and I think, you know, they're pretty cute. And these are what some of the losingest kittens look like, and they look quite different. So let's go back here for a second. Okay, so what you can see is that this very simple and enjoyable voting mechanism has detected a very real signal. And the other thing that's amazing about these kittens to me is that all of these kittens were uploaded by users. So if we think about how, as a survey researcher, you might imagine going about trying to find a picture of the cutest kitten in the world, you might, for example, go to the library, look through some books of kittens, try to pick ones that you think are cute, put them into the survey, and then ask a bunch of people to respond to those kitten pictures. But there's really two big problems with that. The first is that you're baking a lot of yourself into the survey, right? Like you played a big role in shaping the kinds of things that people are even able to respond to. And then the second is that the cutest kitten picture in the world probably isn't in the library. No matter how big and vast the university library that you have access to, it really is small relative to all the kitten pictures in the world. So for those reasons, this is an example of uh, user-generated content, which is something that's very common on the internet, but is really a very uh, uncommon in survey research. And so what Kitten War is doing is it's really solving a fundamental tension that exists in the way that we collect a lot of social data between methods that are good at quantification and methods that are good at openness. So things like surveys are very good at quantifying large amounts of information quickly, um, but the challenge is that surveys are generally not open to new information. That problem with surveys is, is well known, and for that reason we have other techniques like interviews, focus groups, participant observations that are much more open to new information, but those techniques are often slow and hard to quantify. And so what we did in this project is we tried to create a new hybrid technique that combined the quantifiability of surveys with the openness of in-depth interviews to give us a tool that we call wiki surveys. So just like Wikipedia evolves over time based on user input, imagine if we had a survey that evolved over time based on user input. And this would help us solve one of the biggest problems with surveys, which is that they are very close to new information. So in this project, which is a joint project that I did with Karen Levy, we said, let's try to think about what are some general principles that we think wiki surveys should satisfy. So let's try to like take a step back. Let's look at the principles that surveys satisfy. Let's look at the properties of user-generated content online 
And let's try to think what are the properties of this new tool that we're trying to create. And so we decided on three uh, principles that wiki surveys should satisfy. The first is that they should be greedy. And let me explain what I mean by that. So they should, they should uh, good web-based systems um, take advantage, have a very unequal amount of information that's contributed per person. That leads to what's sometimes called the fat head and the long tail. So this graph here is a cartoon of the amount of information contributed to Wikipedia by different editors. So the people here are organized on the x-axis from those that contribute the most. So these are people who are contributing, let's say, 40 hours a week, all the way down to people who contribute the least. These are people who maybe add a comma once a month. And we see that there are some people who contribute tons of information. These people are sometimes called the fat head. And there are a lot of people who contribute just a little bit of information. These people are called the long tail. And it turns out that there is a tremendous amount of information in the fat head and the long tail. Um, now this differs substantially from the way that we collect uh, data in surveys or that we collect data in other kinds of social research projects. So let's imagine someone come to you and said, you know what, I love your survey, I wanna do it 100 times. So first, that would be surprising because usually surveys are such a terrible user experience no one would want to participate more than once. But even if you got past that, you would say, no, I'm sorry, like that's gonna mess up our data. And likewise, if someone came to you and said, yeah, your project is okay, I'll give you two minutes of my time. You might say, well, sorry, we can't really take that. You need to complete the whole survey. Otherwise, we have item non-response. And so what we're saying is we don't take information from people that want to contribute more. We don't take information from the fathead. And we don't take information from the long tail. We collect a fixed amount of information uh, from each person. And so if Wikipedia, for example, collected 10 and only 10 edits from each editor, they would lose about 95% of their edits. So there's a tremendous amount of information in the fat head and the long tail that we don't collect in surveys. And with these wiki surveys, we decided we wanted to be greedy. We wanted to collect as much information as possible. So now you may be thinking, well, if you're collecting information from different amounts of information from different people, isn't that gonna create a problem? And the answer is yes, but we're gonna deal with that in the analysis stage. So rather than saying, we're just not even gonna take the information, um, which is kind of the model now, we'll say, we'll take it, and then we'll deal with that problem later. So the second general principle of wiki, so the first general principle of wiki surveys is that they should be greedy. The second is that they should be collaborative. So um, just as a Wikipedia page is, is the combined contribution of many people, um, surveys should be created collaboratively. They should be not just the constructed by a researcher, but they should be jointly constructed by the researchers and the participants. This allows them to be open to new information. And this new information is often the most valuable information, the stuff that you didn't know ahead of time. Finally, the third general principle of wiki surveys is that they should be adaptive. So if we treated our respondents' time as a valued resource, we would only wanna ask them the most important questions, uh, the ones that would reveal the most information to us. And so generally now, surveys are not adaptive. The order is fixed at the beginning of the questions, and then that doesn't change as the survey goes. But imagine we've done, uh, collected responses from 500 people. At this point, we know actually much more than we knew at the beginning. And so for some of the answers, we should generally, might be able to even guess it without asking the respondent. So what if we could focus the respondent's time on the questions that were most informative? So this is, an this is what it means to be adaptive. So adaptive and collaborative sound kind of similar, but they're distinct. So collaborative is really being about open to new information and adaptive is about using the information that we have to make the data collection more efficient. So in addition to um, describing these uh, principles, we also then created a tool that employed these principles. So the website allourideas.org, we got some funding from Google and we built this free and open source website that anyone in the world can use to host their wiki surveys. 
So let me give you an example of a wiki survey that was used by um, the New York City government. Um, so this was during uh, Mayor Michael Bloomberg's administration. They were doing a project to try to create a greener and greater New York City. So a long-term sustainability plan for the city. So they picked a question, which do you think is a better idea for creating a greener, greater New York City? And then they seeded their wiki survey with 25 ideas. These came from prior outreach that they had done. So these include things like require all big buildings to make energy upgrades, establish an energy planning board, and so on. Then they dumped all that into allourideas.org to create their own wiki survey, which we created for them and gave them a URL, allourideas.org slash planyc. This is uh, an example of what it looked like. And what you see is there are two ideas that are randomly chosen from the pool of ideas. Um, a visitor can click on whichever idea they think is better, and then a new pair comes up. They can click again, and a new pair comes up. And again, you can see that this is basically just kitten war for ideas. Also, you can see there's a big green button there that says add your own idea. Here's where um, uh, participants can add an idea, which then goes to the mayor's office, who has the opportunity to approve the idea, and then it will get um, moderate the idea, basically, and then it will get added to the pool that can be chosen by others. So that's how the survey is open to these new ideas. So here's what, at any time, anyone participating in the website can click view the results and they can see here are the ideas sorted by the score and I'll tell you more about how the score is calculated in a second. So that was the experience that participants had participating in this wiki survey. Let me talk a little bit more about what we were actually trying to estimate, how that score is created. So the data that we have is we have votes that are nested within sessions. So a session is roughly like a person visiting the website at one particular time. So we don't have data on people, there's no accounts. So for example, if you were to visit the website today from your computer at home, and then you were to visit it tomorrow from your mobile phone, that would show up as two different sessions, even though it's created by one person. So all of our analysis is at the level of the session. So we can see that within session one, the first vote was choosing item four over item one, the second was choosing item one over item three, and the third was choosing item four over item three. And so that's the kind of data we have. And then what we want to estimate is this thing um, uh, on the right that we're calling the opinion matrix. So we have one row for each session, one column for each idea, and that each of those entries, each of those theta JKs, is how much respondent J likes item K. And so if we could actually estimate how much everyone likes each item, then we could do lots of things. We could find the items that have the most support. We could find items where people who like these items also like the other items. It's a tremendous amount of information that we can summarize. Now, there's a real challenge here about how we actually estimate the opinion matrix because often the, the, there are hundreds of ideas in these wiki surveys and um, people don't uh, often see all of the ideas. So we have to do some statistical modeling so we assume uh, that voters have a certain um, way that they vote based on their preferences. We have some priors about the distribution of opinion in the population, and then we run statistical inference to try to estimate these parameters from this data. And that's all described in much more detail in our paper. Um, so again, going back to this specific example, which do you think is a better idea for creating a greener, greater New York City? The mayor's office recruited people through a variety of ad hoc techniques, Twitter, Facebook, blogs, etc. So just to be clear, this is not a random sample of New Yorkers. I'm, I'm very aware of that. But there is nothing that would prevent you from using this same technique with a random sample of New Yorkers if you are willing to, rec to recruit one. So this, again, I think clarifies that sampling is separate from how you interact with respondents once they arise. And you should think of wiki surveys as a new way of interacting with respondents, not a new way of sampling. So uh, the mayor's office ran this wiki survey. They collected about 31,000 responses and they had 464 ideas uploaded. These two graphs 
What they are is these are rank order plots, just like the cartoon I showed of Wikipedia. So here we have the people sorted by the um, amount of votes they submit, uh, the, the number of responses they submit. So here uh, we have someone that submits 800, submitted 800 responses. Uh, so we have a small number of people who submitted a lot of responses, and we have a large number of people who submitted a few. So just as I said, the wiki surveys were designed to collect this fat head and the long tail, and this is exactly what happened. And then this little inset here shows the number of new ideas uploaded per session. And again, we see this same kind of fat head and long tail. Um, a small number of people uploaded a large number of ideas, and a large number of people uploaded a small number of ideas. So we wanted the wiki survey, we wanted to create a system that was greedy, and this is exactly what we see in the data. So here, these results show the scores for the top 10 ideas. So the score is the estimated probability that this idea will be to randomly chose another idea for a randomly chosen session. And it goes from zero to 100, so higher scores are better. And so these are the top 10 ideas. And what I wanna emphasize here is that all of these ideas that are in blue were uploaded by users. So eight of the top 10 scoring ideas were uploaded by users and were not in the mayor's office initial set of seed ideas. And to me, this graph shows the real value of wiki surveys, which is that there is stuff that's uploaded that is, does score high, and this new information is often incredibly valuable um, because this new information is the stuff that you don't already know. Um, so we saw this pattern uh, over and over again in many wiki surveys that, that many of the top scoring ideas were uploaded by users and not part of the initial set of seeds, seed ideas. So we did some interviews with wiki survey creators to try to find out what are these ideas, like what kinds of things are getting uploaded um, that, that were not in the initial set of seed ideas. And we found there was a really um, two kinds of things. So the first is what we called alternative framings. So here's an example, keep NYC's drinking water clean by banning fracking in NYC's watershed. So we said to the mayor's office, like fracking, like that's something you all probably knew about, but that wasn't one of your seed ideas. And they said, well, yeah, that's true, but we wouldn't really talk about it like this. We, wouldn't, we might say keep drinking water clean, but we wouldn't say keep drinking water clean by banning fracking in the watershed. So it's an idea that they already knew about, but it's framed differently. And often <clears throat> participants in the survey are able to frame ideas in ways that are more resonant with the public <clears throat> than the researchers themselves. And so often you can see this when social scientists construct surveys, sometimes the words they use and the answers they provide have a deep meaning to them. They're very complicated constructs, but often they may be not very well understood by participants. The second broad category of things that was uploaded and scored well is what we call novel information. So here's an example, plug ships into the electricity grid so they don't idle in port, reducing emissions equivalent to 12,000 cars per ship. So that sounds pretty cool. Um, in fact, you may wonder if this is even true. Um, <clears throat> And the mayor's office investigated and they found out that it is approximately true. So they thought it was closer to about 5,000 cars per ship. So this was an idea that they found really interesting and it was something that they thought actually sat in between their different units. So for example, they have people that work on um, ports, they have people that work on electricity, this is kind of in between. And so it was a kind of thing that might be hard to come up with inside of their own organization, but being open to uh, ideas from others is a way to come up with this kind of novel information. So what we found is that um, lots of ideas that are uploaded by users score well. Um, and now I wanna argue that this is actually just a, it's almost a guaranteed thing. So if you were to do a wiki survey, I would be willing to bet you uh, a beer or a coffee or a drink of your choice that some of your um, highest scoring ideas will come from users because 
of this kind of basic empirical facts that I'm about to show you. So here are the results uh, from the New York City Mayor's Office um, Wiki survey. So there's two graphs here. Um, there are the seed ideas and the user contributed ideas. In each graph, there's a rank order plot. So the x-axis shows the ideas ranked and the y-axis shows the score. So here, higher scores are better. So there's two really important patterns here. The first is that there are more user contributed ideas. There's about 10 times more in this case. The second is that the user contributed ideas have much more variance. So if your idea is that if I open this up to everyone in New York, I'm gonna get lots of junky ideas, that's true. Like most of the worst ideas were uploaded by users. But it's also the case there's much bigger variance of the user contributed ideas. And so it's this combination of volume and variance that ensures the wiki surveys will lead to extreme cases. So if you have a high variance data source, if, if all you care about is the extreme cases, then you want a high volume, high variance data source. Often we think of variance as a bad thing, something to try to minimize or avoid. But if you have the ability to sort through this high variance, high volume data stream, and in this case, that is provided by the users themselves, then you really want to be open to all of these ideas um, because within this huge pile, high variance, high volume pile, you're going to find a few pieces, uh, a few ideas that are really, really excellent. So that's a little bit about what the wiki surveys look like. And also what we wanted to do with this project was to, to create a research project that just gets easier and easier over time. So our hope was that, you know, with the project, there's so much work that goes into it. You, you're pushing this boulder up a hill, you get it to the top, you publish your paper, and then you got to go back down the hill and push another boulder up the hill. And it's just hard, hard work. So what if we could have a system where papers just get easier and easier? Like what if we could create this virtuous cycle where, where uh, we do this research, that helps us improve the website. As we improve the website, we get more users. Those users help us do more research. And then we get this virtuous cycle. So this was the idea. It actually, um, empirically, we've published the paper in 2015, and it's turned out that this has been incredibly, incredibly difficult to do well. But I do think it's something that's important to keep in mind as we design and, and build new systems that by taking advantage of the, the tools of the digital age, we are, it is possible for us to create things that many, many people can use for free. And by creating that, we have the potential to create these virtuous cycles where we can provide a service for the world that simultaneously helps us do our research. And then that process can just go over and over and over and mutually supportive uh, of each other. So we are currently hosting about 18,000 wiki surveys. We have almost a million ideas and 33 million votes. It's been used by a wide range of groups. Here are some examples. So, there have been governmental organizations. So e Democracia, for example, is a project that was done by the Brazilian House of Representatives, the UN. It's also been used by social movements like uh, Occupy Wall Street and Wikipedia. I was particularly happy that Wikipedia used it since Wikipedia was in fact one of the inspirations for wiki surveys. And we've also had it used at, at some firms like, like Mason and, and Harvard Business Publishing. So that's the end of the um, project about wiki surveys. And if you'd like more information, I recommend that you read the paper that I wrote with Karen Levy that was published in 2015. So now I want to move on to this second edition and extension. Uh, it's an, an, an example of amplified asking. It's a next step. So during the lecture on, uh, during the video on uh, linking surveys and big data or in chapter three of Bit by Bit, I talked about this study by Blumenstock and colleagues. Now I want to tell you about a new study that was published subsequent that builds on this work. Um, and this paper is really amazing and surprising to me. But first, before I explain that, I want to have a little bit of a digression to give some context. So, Supervised learning is a 
branch of machine learning where you get lots of input output pairs and the goal is to develop a function that will predict the output from the input. And this is one of the few ideas that shows up across multiple chapters in bit by bit. So this is the diagram that I used to illustrate the Blumenstock study. Here, um, this is a diagram in chapter two of bit by bit um, on observing behavior. This is uh, from the study of social media posts in China. Again, you see a very similar picture because there's a very similar example of supervised learning going on. Here's something from chapter five of bit by bit about mass collaboration, a very similar picture, although this time in the context of astronomy. But again, you have uh, an example of supervised learning. And so you have, again, lots of input output pairs with the goal is to develop a function to, that will predict the output from the input. So the examples that I showed you so far, the features were all engineered by the researcher. They were created by the researcher. But what if there was a way that you could learn the right features automatically from the data so that a researcher didn't have to have any specialized skill to know what the right features would be. You could somehow just learn them from the data. And this is one of the ideas underlying uh, deep learning. And we don't have time to explain what deep learning is, but I would recommend this paper as a, as a nice introduction um, to, and relatively short introduction to the field. It was published in Nature in 2015. So this paper combining satellite imagery and machine learning to predict poverty takes advantage of these uh, deep learning techniques. Here's an example of how this was covered in the press. Artificial intelligence is predicting human poverty from space. Um, so let's learn a little bit more about what this paper is. So if you were to click on this link, um, what you would see is you would see satellite data from Rwanda. And you can actually get satellite data like this from uh, pretty much everywhere in the world. And so, Here's an example. And so what we can see here, this is from Kigali. We can see certain features in this. We can see roads, we can see trees, we can see buildings. These buildings have, um, it looks like uh, very like sturdy roofs. So we can tell something about this area and its wealth by looking at this satellite picture. And so what this, uh, uh, the idea of this paper by Gene et al. was to use these kinds of satellite images to actually try to measure the amount of poverty in these places. So again, the goal is similar to the goal of Blumenstock. That is, we want to collect reliable data about wealth and poverty in developing countries. It's often too expensive to collect this with surveys. So are there big data sources that we could use that would help us make these, that when combined with surveys would help us make these estimates faster and cheaper. So people had previously used um, satellite images to try to estimate wealth. So this, for example, but they had generally used data from night pictures. These are sometimes called night lights. So areas where there's lots of light at night turns out are generally wealthier than areas where there's not lots of light at night. So this is Manhattan and you can see it's a generally uh, very bright at night and it's also a very wealthy area. But one problem with night lights um, is that generally they're not very good at distinguishing the amount of wealth in very poor areas. So generally there's low levels of light in very poor areas in developing countries. And so the night light tr um, technique doesn't work very well in these, in these areas. So the prior research used night lights with survey data to estimate um, wealth in places where there was no survey data. This Gene et al. paper uses day pictures and night lights and survey data to estimate wealth in places without survey data. So how do they combine these day pictures and the night lights and the survey data? So what they do is they start with a convolutional neural network pre-trained on ImageNet. The ImageNet is a large data set of pictures of all kinds of things like hamsters and weasels. So they start with a neural net trained with this data. Um, then they use that um, neural, then they train that neural net to predict the night lights from the day pictures. And so the advantage here is there are lots and lots of day pictures 
and night light. So there's lots and lots of data that they could use for training. Then they take the features from that convolutional neural net and they, they train the, then they use a ridge regression to predict the cluster mean survey response. So let me explain what I mean by that. So once you've got this um, deep learning, um, in this second step where you're training the convolutional neural net to predict the night lights from the day pictures, what's happening is that the uh, the neural net is learning what kinds of features of pictures are good at predicting night lights. So for example, paved roads might be good at predicting night lights. And one of the amazing things about this to me is you don't have to tell it, look for paved roads, look for um, professional roofs, not thatched roofs. Uh, it somehow learns all of these features from looking at lots and lots of uh, patterns between day pictures and night lights. And then once it has certain features um, from pictures, you can use those features to then try to predict survey data. And so here are the results. So these are for four countries. Um, the x-axis here is the observed consumption and the y-axis is the predicted consumption. And so you can see across four countries, this technique seems to work reasonably well. Again, there's a more careful description in the paper. Um, you also see that how well it works varies slightly from country to country. So one of the things about these kind of techniques uh, is that there's no theoretical guarantee that it will work. Uh, kind of the amount of confidence we have uh, in part depends on empirical validation. And so the fact that this seems to work reasonably well in at least four different, in these four different countries seems to be a promising thing. Uh, another, so, so one way that this paper goes beyond the Blumenstock et al. paper is by looking at multiple countries. Another way that this paper goes beyond the Blumenstock et al. paper is by using satellite data, they're able to remove one of the biggest challenges that Blumenstock had, which was data access. So it's not going to be easy for lots of researchers to get access to the mobile phone data, but the satellite data is much easier to access because it has much fewer uh, privacy concerns about it. So here's another way that this Gene et al. paper goes beyond the Blumenstock et al. paper. So one of the things it does is it tries to use data from one country to, to use a model trained in one country and then use that model in a different country. So one of the challenges with many of these techniques is that they can be somewhat circular. So with the Blumenstock et al. paper, he showed that technique worked well at, in Rwanda at that time, but Rwanda is a place where we have already the demographic and health survey. How would it work in a place where we don't have the demographic and health survey? That's really what we, one of the places where it'd be the most valuable. And so what Gene and all did in their paper is they would, for example, here, this panel A is about uh, uh, consumption expenditures. They would train the model in Nigeria, and then they would use the model uh, to try to make uh, estimates about other countries. And so what we see is, in general, models do best when they're trained on their own country, which kind of makes sense. But we also see that they can do an okay job of actually making estimates about countries that they weren't trained on. So it shows there is some ability. The, the things that they are learning in these images are general enough that they can work across countries. The other thing that we can see is that the results are somewhat different for assets and consumption. So this gets at the point that these kinds of amplified asking techniques, again, we don't have a general um, a theorem, that a tech, formal guarantee that they will work. And you know it will work better for some things than other things. It works better in some countries than other countries. And so one of the big open questions is like, under what conditions does this work well um, within a setting? And under what conditions will this transfer well to another setting? So this study, the Gene et al. also illustrates this uh, idea about zero variable cost, which comes up a lot in computational social science. So, as the number of images processed increases, how does the cost change? So if you as a human are going through and labeling those pictures, this one has paved roads, this one has dirt roads, 
this one the roads are very wide, this one the roads are very narrow. That's going to be relatively easy at the beginning. You're going to be able to very quickly label 10, 20 images, but you know, you want to double the number of images, you need to double the amount of work. You want to 10 times the amount of images, you want to, you need to 10 times your work. You want a million times the number of images, you need to million times your amount of work. On the other hand, having the computer learn the features is harder at the beginning. It takes a lot more work to set up, but then you can feed it in basically unlimited amounts of data. And, and um, so having the computer learn the features is part of what makes this technique scalable uh, and allows them to process really uh, enormous numbers of images. So another great thing about this study is that uh, all the replication data is available. So if you're interested in doing this, you can go to this GitHub uh, website and try to do it yourself. So that's the second uh, addition and extension that I wanted to talk about today. So again, the first was about wiki surveys. The second was about a new approach to amplified asking. And this is the fifth in a series of five videos about survey research in the digital age. Thank you.